Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. We're going to dig deep, so be prepared. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. And today, we're going to talk about serpents and dragons. They should all drown in lakes of blood. Now they will know why they are afraid of the dark. Now they will learn why they fear the night. There are so many cool serpents and dragons to talk about. I was thinking of doing a serpents only episode and then a dragons only episode. And I just couldn't help myself but mix the two because, you know, stories mix the two all the time. Uh, that clip you just heard was James Earl Jones playing Thulsa Doom in the great uh uh, Dino De Laurentiis film Conan the Barbarian. There were other Conan movies that I wouldn't dare call great, but that one was absolutely fantastic. And by the way, I might mention follows almost scene for scene uh, the same type of storyline that Jeremiah Johnson does with just a couple of plot points reversed but still existing at the same time frame along the movie. But that's neither here nor there for our discussion here. So... Um, so, well, well, how about, how about Thulsa Doom? He's like a were-serpent in this film. Um, he ends up being revealed as, well, first he's revealed as kind of a conquering Attila the Hun kind of character in which he sweeps through villages, kills uh, men, women, and children, or kills all the men, and sometimes the women, and takes the children in as slaves, mostly looking for high-quality steel, a very pragmatic raid. Later, he's revealed to be a cult leader, and he creates this uh, franchise of cults and cult temples around uh, these prehistoric, uh, fantastical lands. Um, Hyperborea is the fictional continent on which uh, Conan resides. This is well before recorded history according to the old uh, Robert Howard tales of Conan, where it originated. Although uh, there have been plenty of groups who claim um, lost continents like uh, Hyperborea, um, Atlantis, uh, Mu. These continents once existed and then sunk into the ocean. Who am I to say? I don't know. Uh, but Thulsa Doom was cool. And he, among other things, has this power of service serpents that we see in all sorts of tales, this ability to hypnotize others with his eyes, snakes, according to folklore, and maybe perhaps biology have the ability to kind of hypnotize or paralyze, say, birds or smaller prey. And I think there's something to that as far as this uh, fight or flight response. It's not always fight or flight. Sometimes fight or flight or stay unmoving and paralyzed. And perhaps the predators whose vision is based on movement can't see you. And I think even uh, some of us uh, homo sapiens, I think some of us have that same kind of reaction to really terrifying predators where your first reaction is to freeze up. And I think that's where, or that's a connection to some of the uh, monsters who have the powers of paralysis come up. I think monsters who can paralyze and turn uh, others to stone is worthy of a whole episode too. Um, but that's a that's one of Thulsa Doom's features in this film. Another one that snakes seem to have is this wisdom, uh, because he reveals over and over in the film that he knows more than anybody else. He has the answers to the secrets that Conan is seeking, not just about his own history, uh, but about the nature of existence and life itself and of the gods. And that kind of wisdom has always been a feature of really cool serpents and dragons. So let's let's go to let's go to the first dragon that we have record of. It's in an old Mesopotamian creation story called the Enuma Elish. 
and our records show that that was composed at about 1200 BC in Mesopotamia, and so that would make it younger than the Epic of Gilgamesh. Epic of Gilgamesh would be older, and another difference is this wouldn't be so much literature as a sacred text and a creation story and a story that lays out some of their own rituals and ceremonies that they reenact every or they reenacted every um, New Year's, and so. This story in, uh, involves first a dragon named Tiamat, and she is the cosmic primordial dragon, which is synonymous with the cosmic primordial force. She herself is creation and chaos simultaneously. She is also the sea and the salt water, and she is also everything that gives birth to everything else. And she is not necessarily good, not necessarily evil, but ex- but both creative and ferocious and destructive if you get on her bad side. And so after giving birth to all the gods and the gods become precocious and noisy and they bother her, she gives birth to all these great monsters to go attack them and punish them to quiet them down. The gods react by going and killing a mate that she has chosen for herself, the freshwater god, and that angers her so much that she's deciding to come and destroy all the gods. And the gods band together and elect one younger and newer god named Marduk to go out and fight her. And then the fight scene between Marduk going out to face the ferocious and unbeatable Tiamat is really cool. Here's a translation of it. Face to face they came, Tiamat and Marduk, sage of the gods. They engaged in combat, they closed for battle. The lord spread his net and made it encircle her. To face her he dispatched the wind, which had been behind. Tiamat opened her mouth to swallow it, and he forced in the wind so that she could not close her lips. Fierce winds descended her belly, her insides were constipated, and she stretched her mouth wide. He shot an arrow which pierced her belly, split her down the middle, and slit her heart, vanquished her, and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on top of her. When he had slain Tiamat, the leader, he broke up her regiments. Her assembly was scattered. And then Marduk goes on to butcher up her body and spread her out and make the world of creation that we currently know. And so he makes the earth and the mountains and the lakes and the skies and he makes everything that we know. Now, one fascinating feature of this is this story is so old and it happened to have been told by the very people who not only influenced uh, ancient Hebrews, Israelites, um, but also at one point captured them and so of course there's a lot of cross-cultural tales well in the texts that formed the bible in the earliest ones there are still some hints of a tiamat story that later got deleted and edited out which is fascinating and so there are hints of this uh, in in Job in the creation story that involved Yahweh the Lord fighting with an ancient cosmic dragon, um, but there are also little hints left in Genesis. For instance, the abyss that is at the beginning of Genesis, the uh, sometimes translated as void, sometimes translated as the the abyss, as in the beginning when God created heaven, the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Uh, that word, the void, the abyss, uh, in Hebrew is tehom, and tehom is a version of or is cognate with Tiamat and it happens to also be a feminine word and it has to also uh, to have a connection to serpents and dragons and so 
if we're going to piece together little clues and probably the influence from the Enuma Elish, then we have a, an old deleted story of Yahweh using a sword or a weapon of some type to fight the cosmic void and the cosmic abyss herself, Tehom, the dragon of chaos and creation. And once he kills her, chops her up and makes the universe from her body. And now all we have left is there's just chaos and void. And he uses that and forms it and separates it and makes everything more organized, separating sky from earth and water from sky and all that stuff to create uh, all the universe that we have now. But an older story may have been that he fought a dragon, killed her, and used her body to make the universe. That's pretty cool. Oh, let's talk about, I know, let's talk about Jormungandr, or Jormungandr, the Midgard Serpent from Norse mythology. This is a serpent that is so big, he encircles the entire world under the sea. So he's at the, he's at the ocean floor and he's circling the entire world like the equator and all the way back around to his own tail. And that's an image that we get so often of serpents and of dragons that they will encircle and sometimes even begin consuming themselves in their own tail, like the famous image of the Ouroboros. And that very often has an association not only with uh, eternity, as you might imagine many circles being associated with eternity, um, but also this sense of trying to get away from yourself and then finding yourself lost once again in yourself. Um, Jung, Carl Jung took that, took that to mean something like uh, this Ouroboros or this snake being the unconscious and your ability uh, to try to get away from your unconscious mind through conscious attention and ending up right back where you started into unconsciousness. And that's pretty cool. But Jormungandr is one of the three children of Loki and Anger Boda, or Anger Broda. Uh, she was a giantess. We know very little about her except that she was the mother uh, of three really amazing creatures. Uh, one is the Midgard Serpent, the other is Hell, goddess of the underworld and of the dead, and that's where we get our current word for Hell. And her third child by Loki is Fenrir the Wolf, the Fenris Wolf. And he has to be, well, I've, I was asked at a live event uh, by a, a brilliant fellow uh, who dared ask a question like this. Well, okay, who's your favorite monster? Don't put me on the spot like that. There are too many to choose from. I have a hard enough time just narrowing them down just to talk about them in the episodes. But the answer I gave at the time was Fenrir, because I think it's true. I think about Fenrir way more than I ought to, way more than I think about actual responsibilities in life. He is so awesome. Future episode on Fenrir and wolves and more on wolves. As amazing as our conversation was, in my opinion, uh, with uh, Pinkney Benedict on wolves and as many cool things as we got to. There are so many more wolves to talk about. I'm getting off track. Let's get back to the dragons. Jormungandr. He, uh, he doesn't get a whole lot of personality except that he is featured in some really cool tales and always kind of one-upping Thor. Of course, almost everybody one-ups Thor. He's like a, he's a good meaning, good hearted old fella who tries to go out and do his job and, it, but he just gets fooled and, and made to look like a fool almost by everybody. And so one of these stories involves Thor going out to fight giants and trolls, and they end up casting some illusions on him and playing tricks on him as they challenge him to feats of strength. And one of them is to pick up one of their house cats. And he's like, of course I can pick up a house cat. <laughs> the Norse uh, and, and a lot of the Viking people were really into cats, by the way. Um, and so he's like, of, of course I can pick up this house cat. So he reaches his arms under his belly and he tries to pick up this cat. And he gets like three of its four paws off the ground, but there's always just one paw touching. And the 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 giants challenging him are like, no, you got to get all four paws off the ground. So he shifts and he lifts again, but 
there's one of the four paws still touching and he can't get this thing off the ground and then later after he, he after he surrenders in defeat later then they reveal to him by the way we were tricking you the whole time and you the house cat you were picking up you were actually picking up the midgard serpent from the bottom of the ocean and you almost detached him from the world itself you came really close so you actually did a pretty good job and uh rather than feel better about himself he just got angry because he's thor and that's what he does So at a later point, uh, one of these giants invites him to go fishing with him and Thor and like, okay, so why does Thor want to go out and kill these types of people or these types of monsters, these giants and trolls, but then hang out with them and go fishing with them? I don't know. Maybe the Norse were like that. Maybe they would. Well, actually a lot of their, their sagas are kind of like that. Uh, you'd get on their bad side and they'd try to kill you and get on their good side. They'd hang out with you at any moment. You might get on their bad side and they'd kill you again. It's just kind of how it goes, actually, in a lot of cultures still to this day. And the Norse were no exception. So they go on this fishing trip, and Thor, uh, for, well, they go, so they go on this fishing trip and the giant says, well, you got to bring your own bait. And so Thor runs over to one of the cattle he sees there and knocks off its head. It doesn't say that he like cuts off its head with a knife or anything. It just says he, you know, removes his head and he normally only carries the hammer Mjolnir. So I, I guess he just knocked his head clean off. He puts it on a hook he, and they row way, way out into the middle of the sea. And he, and he puts that, uh, that cow head on a hook and throws it out into the waters and he gets a bite and it's the Midgard serpent Jormungandr his old foe that he couldn't lift off the ground and he's he really wants to reel this thing in and so he's pulling Jormungandr and trying to reel him in and he's standing on the boat and his knuckles keep knocking against the gunwale because Jormungandr's pulling so hard and he's pulling so hard back and he's and he's standing with all of his might and his feet go through the bottom of the boat all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and his heels are digging into the ocean floor as he's trying to reel this thing in and Jormungandr's pulling with all of his might and it's creating a great big hurricane and a storm and the giant in the boat who had been talking some trash earlier about how weak and scared Thor was is watching all this and he's terrified and so he just reaches out and cuts the line and Jormungandr gets away and Thor is so angry that he he of course uh anyways always angry and then he just smashes the giant's head uh that's another great story and so Jormungandr ends up contending with Thor at least one last time. There are other uh, hints at other uh, Jormungandr versus Thor tales. But in Ragnarok, at the very end of all things, when the gods are beset by all the monsters and all the creatures and all of the demons of hell and of, and of the world of Surt and of the fiery realms and everything in the universe comes in on them. And they knew this from the beginning of time. This was going to be their end. And so they have this great big battle. Well, Thor finally squares off against the Midgard serpent who blows poison and boils the waters of the world and drops Thor not before Thor can get a good blow in on his skull. And so they kill each other simultaneously. The end of Jormungandr and Thor. Sorry about that spoiler alert, by the way, but that's how the world's going to end. We should we should mention ever so briefly um, two dragons that we've already talked about before. Uh, Fafnir from the Saga of the Volsungs, slain by um, Sigurd. And then the Beowulf dragon, uh, fought and slain by Beowulf and a sidekick of his. Um, although that one killed Beowulf, but Fafnir wasn't able to kill Sigurd. Um, in those two tales, since we covered him already, I'll just add a couple of really cool details. In the Fafnir story, after Sigurd slays Fafnir, he disembowels him and removes his heart and boils his heart over a campfire and as he's cooking it 
uh, alongside Regan, the treacherous little dwarf that talked him into doing this in the first place, who was actually planning on killing Sigurd in his sleep to take the treasure for himself that night. As Sigurd's roasting this heart over the fire and it's boiling, he reaches out to touch it to test the meat, as you're not supposed to do, but we all do. And it burns his finger and he gets some of the blood on his finger too. And he licks his finger because, you know, it's burnt, but it has dragon blood on it. And he has thus drunk dragon's blood. And now he can hear the speech of birds. And so he hears these thrushes in a nearby bush. And they're gossiping. They're saying, Oh, look at Sigurd. He doesn't know that Regan's just planning to kill him tonight. He's going to be a sucker. And he's going to have done all of this and not even get to enjoy the glory of it. And Sigurd hears this and realizes it's true now because he can hear the speech of birds since he has tasted dragon blood. And so then he kills Regan. And that's the end of that part of his story. He wins. But once again, we see a connection of serpents and birds. Uh, there are many tales of dragons without wings. Well, Fafnir doesn't have wings, for instance. Um, the uh, the serpent in Eden doesn't have wings. Uh, the first dragons in Tolkien's universe um, in on Middle Earth, Glaurung, who is created through evil experiments by Melkor, the Lord of Lord of Darkness, or this God of all creation and darkness in Tolkien's world, who was who uh, Sauron answered to. Sauron was a lieutenant of Morgoth, or Melkor. He had two names. He created Glaurung, and Glaurung was a hypnotizing and powerful and um, weapon-proof dragon who caused a lot of harm and a lot of really cool stories. He didn't have wings either, but we keep seeing wings being put on these serpents, um, and there are some really cool theories on that. In fact, you see some of these theories come together in some of the images we still use. Like you've seen the Cadduces, uh, well, that's one of the many ways to pronounce it. I'm sure it's wrong, but you see the Cadduces, uh, at, at least in America and a lot of places that are medically related. It's that staff with the two wings on top and it's got two snakes and they're twining and that's like a symbol of medicine and that was a staff that Hermes the Greek god carried and it, and it was among other things like a symbol of trades and and, a, and an alchemical symbol for mercury the planet and the substance and the god also Her, uh, Hermes Trismegistus who is the same guy as Mercury he was this occult a figure who supposedly revealed secrets of magic. Um, so you have this symbol showing up uh, all over the place on businesses, and there's a, a related symbol, uh, the the uh, the rod or the staff of Asclepius, who was this great god of healing, and that's that's a staff with just one snake winding its way up the top. Uh, some people say the two shouldn't be confused, but I mean, they're pretty much meaning the same thing in most scenarios. So I don't see the problem. Both of them, you see this, uh, this snake kind of climbing up this thing, this tree like thing. And in one of them, you see the wings associated with it. Uh, Carl Jung was one who said that maybe this has something to do with the, the image of the serpent being the mediator between earth and heaven. And maybe the wings that we put on dragons in our dreams and in our tales has something to do with like taking the serpent into a type of transcendence in that it carries a certain wisdom. Uh, that we want to achieve. Well, how did it get associated with healing then? Well, a lot of people observed that a snake would shed its skin and come out anew. And that also associated with this cycle of rebirth we so often see with dragons uh, or serpents encircling and biting their own tails. We see this idea of uh, renewal and rebirth constantly associated with the serpent. Uh, but what about the wisdom part of it? Well, let's talk about Nakash. He's the serpent of Eden. Uh, the Hebrew word for him was Nakash. 
and it meant simultaneously a serpent, but also brazen, as in made of bronze. And so there's some connection with him and uh, a later brazen snake uh, that Moses lifts so that the Israelites in the desert can be cured of their viper wounds. Um, but Nakash was fascinating. And he, of course, is involved in the probably the most famous story about gaining wisdom, right? In Eden, when Adam and Hava uh, translated as Eve, although no one really knows how we lost the, her actual name, Hava, and, and got Eve. That's a weird little mystery. But Adam and Hava are in the Garden of Eden, and then uh, they talk with a serpent and end up eating the forbidden fruit and gaining this kind of wisdom. And there's this association there with snakes and wisdom once again. Um, and later groups of people like the Nessenes would look at the serpent from Eden, Nakash, as not a villain like I think a lot of tr tr uh, Christian traditions have. And in fact, later Christian traditions, mostly popularized by John Milton, uh, reassociate uh, the serpent in Eden with Satan. There's some hints at it. They're not quite as explicit as I, as I think we're led to believe in Revelation that uh, Satan and the serpent are the same. I mean, that's a cool idea if you want a unified narrative. Uh, from a book uh, created by a whole bunch of separate documents um, by separate people at separate times and separate cultures. Uh, it's it's amazingly unified in a lot of people's theories, and John Milton did a fantastic job with it. Um, but and not everybody saw that serpent as a villain. A lot of people like the Nicenes, who were some of the first Gnostics, uh, these kind of these folks who mixed Christian theology with Greek philosophy, uh, and, and because they ended up not being orthodox, a lot of them ended up being hunted down and slaughtered as heretics. And we don't really have many Gnostics left, but they um, saw him associated with wisdom and the Savior Himself. And a lot of uh, Kabbalist Jewish mystics and Hebrew mystics. Uh, we'll see the same thing because once they add up n the Kabbalistic numbers of names, you take however the name is spelled in Hebrew and you follow, you add up the numbers associated with each letter, like Aleph is one, right? And Beth is two, but it's not as simple as just one uh, all the way for each one unit for each letter, like later some letters are worth a hundred points or right, 200 points. And you, so you take any name and you add up the letters and that gives you a sacred number in any other word that happens to have that number. The chances are quite low, by the way, that any two words would have the exact same number. Any other word in sacred text that has that same number shows you that there's a sacred connection there to some of these mystics. And they found the name for Nakash, the serpent of Eden, has the exact same number as the, as the name uh, or the word Messiah or the, the Hebrew word for Messiah. And so they saw the serpent and the Messiah as one as well. Well, how would anybody do that, by the way? Like, why would anyone do that if he's a villain? Well, I mean, if you look at the story itself, this this is where it gets kind of controversial uh, for some listeners. I get people really mad when I just say what the story says. But, I mean, I just invite you to read it for yourself. Uh, not, uh, I'm not challenging anyone's interpretation or theology. I'm just saying what the narrative says is that Yahweh tells Adam and Eve, or uh, Hava, I'll just call her Eve, um, but Yahweh tells them, you can eat of any fruit, but just not of this one, not of this tree, which we find out to be the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and uh, so the serpent comes up to Eve and he's like, oh, why can't you eat of that one? And Eve says, Eve said, well, you know, Yahweh told us you shall not eat of it or even touch it lest you die. And the serpent said, oh, you certainly will not die. No, here's how it goes. Yahweh knows that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. 
And so he was like, sounds good to me. I'm, I, that sounds good. I want to do it. And so she takes a bite. And before the paragraph is over, uh, she said, um, it says, then the, and she feeds it to Adam and he eats it. And before the paragraph's over, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and, and they realized they were naked and they didn't surely die. Just like the serpent said, he said, it will actually open your eyes. And sure enough, the very next thing is their eyes were opened. And so he wasn't actually lying. Yahweh was lying to them. And you could say, well, doesn't, doesn't he later punish them with mortality? No, they were, they were actually already mortal because he does punish them in different ways, you know, like the, the pain of childbirth and the, the pain of labor and all that kind of stuff. But that's not what gets them kicked out of Eden. What gets them kicked out is, as uh, Yahweh says, toward the end of chapter 3, uh, that same chapter, just a couple paragraphs down, uh, Yahweh says, See, man has become like one of us, knowing what is good and what is bad. Therefore, he must not be allowed to put out his hand and take fruit from the tree of life also, and thus eat of it and live forever. The Lord God, uh, Yahweh, therefore banished him from the Garden of Eden. And so, well, that's what that's what the serpent said. He said, they, Yahweh and his, and his celestial host, the Elohim, uh, they don't want you to become gods like them. And if you eat of it, you'll know things like them. Well, once they do and their eyes are opened and he was right and Yahweh was lying, then the only thing left is one tree that's going to make them immortal. And you always like, Oh no, if they eat that, they will fully become gods. And as it says, therefore he kicked them out of the garden of Eden, not for the first one, but to stop them from eating the second one. And that's exactly what, uh, what the serpent told him. That's what Nakash told him. And, and sure enough, uh, they wouldn't, uh, Yahweh wouldn't have been worried about them becoming immortal if they were already immortal, right? They were, they were mortal to begin with. And so I think there was a lot of, uh, a lot of different levels of irony in that original oldest text, very often called the J text, where we get that part of the creation story. I think that a lot of, a lot of irony playing in there, but also hints at really deep myths. Um, because that's so complex and so gray area, uh, that doesn't lend itself really well towards sermons and, and toward a kind of orthodoxy of, of uh, sacred belief. There's some indication that the original J text wasn't necessarily sacred, but it, it soon became so. And so uh, that that story gets reinterpreted and added on to, that's fine, whatever. But the, the story that we have in the text is something different than most people here. And it involves a really cool, wise snake who is only telling the truth, but is still finding ways to cause trouble. So I think a lot of... Um, a lot of the literature and the myth and the tales um, and the pseudo-historical tales of dragons in Western culture often involve, um, well, and a lot of like symbolism study and even some some Jungian psychology kind of stuff. A lot of them look at the dragon as the symbol of like creation and destruction and chaos and the unconscious and the potential and the darkness and all this kind of stuff. Um, but to, to see a culture that flips that script and looks at it a little bit differently, uh, that's, I think that's the fundamental difference that you get in, say, Chinese dragons, which are not, I mean, the simple way to say it is like Western dragons are good, are evil, and Eastern dragons are good. And, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that, necessarily. It would, it would seem that the, all those kinds of uh, chaotic and urges to life forces that we kind of associate with serpents and dragons uh, get shifted to the tiger of the yin and yang. The tiger is associated with the yin, 
and then the yang, uh, the more uh, standard hierarchical order and good fortune and um, articulation of clear thoughts and uh, all the kind of opposites of chaos and potential and unconscious. Um, so the other side of that, that gets associated with the dragon. And of the, oh, and of the four, of the four mystical or the four magical beings of a lot of uh, Chinese, say, philosophy um, and sacred beliefs, they are Lung the dragon. But the other three are the unicorn, the phoenix, and the turtle. And so anytime you see a turtle, you know that he is one of the four right up there with dragons, unicorns, and, and phoenices. Uh, the, who knew that the turtle was so cool? Well, the Chinese do. So there you go. Oh, we've got a we've got a famous dragon slaying story, or dragon fighting story that you may have heard. Saint George and the Dragon, um, and one one famous recording of that is done by the famous William Caxton, who brought the printing press to England and re, and translated and recorded a lot of old tales. And we still have his. His is pretty cool, um, and it, it basically involves. Uh, this dragon who is just hungry and he wants to eat people like a lot of monsters and this kingdom decides well this king decides okay to keep it at bay we'll just send somebody out every now and then and the only fair way to do is that do that is by random lottery and so they'll just pick out somebody to send a lot of stories involved with that kind of feature you've noticed the minotaur story for instance shirley jackson's the lottery hunger games that kind of thing and so this works for a while until one day the lot shows that the king's daughter, his own daughter, gets picked. And then that's when he's like, no, this isn't a good system anymore. What, what, would you, uh, what more would you expect out of a politician, right? <laughs> or not a politician, what more would you expect out of a political leader, we might say? Um, and then the people were like, that's, you can't play by those rules. We're going to like rise up and take you down if you back out of this deal. And he's like, oh, okay, fine. So he sends his daughter to die. And then that's when St. George happens to ride along. And the daughter or the princess is like, no, you got to get out of here before the dragon's coming to eat me. And unlike all the pagans that were feeding their people to the dragon and the king and this daughter saint george is a christian and so he comes with like nope i'll just show him the cross and beat him i'll beat him with the power of jesu uh, jesus and and i'll win and sure enough the dragon comes he makes a sign of the cross charges him down wounds him with his spear but he doesn't kill him the cool part of the story is that he takes the girdle off of the princess and wraps it on the dragon like a leash and leads it back to town with the princess. And as soon as he comes to town, well, people start freaking out. Here's what it says in Caxton. Um, oh, by the way, that, uh, you know, even though he like, uh, subdued the dragon, he's, he's letting the princess, uh, lead her to, I should say that the princess leads this dragon to town, which is an image I, I think that, you know, you see get used in things like, uh, like Game of Thrones and stuff with the, the small little princess once conceived as of, of as a victim, you know, brings in the power of the dragon, once again associating kind of dragon and, and power and femininity together. Um, and it says, uh, Then she led him to the city, and the people fled by mountains and valleys, and said, Alas, alas, we shall all be, we shall be all dead. Alas, alas, we shall be all dead. Uh, sends a little bit Monty Python in. Uh, St. George is like, if everyone gets baptized and converts to Christianity, I'll finally slay the thing for good. Otherwise, I'm just going to leave them here with you. They're like, okay, okay, we're good. Uh, Christianity, and they all convert. The end of that story. Oh man, so many other cool, uh, so many other cool things to talk about. We've, uh, there's been some people speculating about this idea that human vision actually evolved in part to better spot snakes. Um, as in like we, we have 
humans have a better vision than almost any other creature in the animal kingdom except uh, some birds of prey. Other than birds of prey, we have some of the best vision in the universe as far as we know. And we're really good at spotting patterns, and especially in the lower field of our vision. And some people are saying that that's because we, when, uh, say, in deep, deep prehistory, hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of years ago, before we were fully humans, our ancestors in trees only had one significant and recurring predator, and that was serpents and reptiles climbing up in the trees and snatching us up. And so we needed to be able to spot them well. And having a good vision uh, takes a lot of brain computing power. And our brain started enlarging from there. And associating that story with like the Nakash story in Eden, in which it's the serpent who gives us wisdom. It's the serpent who opens our eyes, maybe evolutionarily serpents open our eyes i don't know about that uh, necessarily but the idea is cool worth looking into at least it tells us that these serpents and these dragons and these monsters they keep coming up in our tales because there is something deep and our dreams and our culture and all over the place they keep coming up for some reason and at the very least, we can say, because they're freaking cool is why. Oh, man, I'm not sure I got through all the dragons that I even and serpents that I even wanted to talk about. I got through some really cool ones, though. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Monster Professor. What, are, what monster are we going to talk about next time? Stay tuned. Wait and see. I'll talk to you next time on The Monster Professor.